Good afternoon. Welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gillo, the Director of Professional Development for the Brown School, Washington University in St. Louis. So glad to have you with us for today's program. I want to acknowledge my friend and colleague, Laura Peer, the Training Manager for the International Center for Child Health and Development. Laura is going to be helping to moderate uh, questions and answers in the chat uh, for you today. So um, please do feel free to engage with her that way. For those of you joining us on Zoom, you are muted throughout this program. We can't see or hear you. We also don't have a way of um, calling on raised hands. But please do use the chat feature to send in your questions and comments, um, either just to the panel or if you have a thought that you want to share to the whole room, um, you have that option as well. I want to say hello to folks joining us on YouTube. We are delighted you're here and we don't have a way to directly connect with you. Um, so glad to have you though. Before we get started with today's program, I want to let you know some of the things that are coming up on Open Classroom. We are back on tomorrow, same time. Uh, Derek Brown is giving an introduction to economic analysis for policy. That's a program offered in partnership with the Social Policy Institute. And then particularly want to flag for your attention an event we've just added for next Monday, that's the 19th. Uh, Professor Tim McBride is giving us an update on Medicaid expansion in Missouri. Uh, there's dynamics going on in funding and in the legislature trying to bring the constitutional amendment we passed in August into reality. So if you're watching that, Tim is watching it very closely and has um, next steps and sort of inside information to share with us. And then on Tuesday, uh, a week from today, Chris Fry is delivering the first of a two-part series on your next move, the when, why, and what of the new retirement. That's a program sponsored in partnership with the Friedman Center. So lots of good stuff for various interests, and we hope that you will check some of it out. I'll drop a link into chat um, for you to register if you'd like to. But now we're ready to get started with today's program. And to get that started, it's my great pleasure to introduce Mary McKay, the Nidor Family and Centene Corporation Dean of the Brown School. Welcome, Mary. Good. Well, thank you, Janet. Thank you for all the work that you do on behalf of Washington University and our school, the Brown School. So it is my privilege um, to welcome all of you um, to this open classroom event. Um, this, uh, this platform and work is really organized and led by two incredibly important centers, iChad and Smart Africa Center. Um, and so you see Dr. Fred's um, you know, screen that you know he's there, Dr. Fred, colleagues like Proscovia, Ozge, Laura, and so many others are leading an incredibly important portfolio of work focused on children and families on the continent of Africa. And so we're so grateful that so many of you have joined us to hear our speaker today and to move this conversation forward. I know, um, Prost, you're gonna also talk about an upcoming conference that we have that we're very, very excited. If you haven't registered, um, we'll make sure that we put some information in the chat and Prost will talk about that as well. So thank you to our speaker. Thank you to iChad, Smart Africa. We're so, so grateful for the work that you do. Um, children, families um, across the continent and, and globally really do benefit from the research that you conduct. So thank you. And let me turn it over to my faculty colleague, Proscovia. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dini Mary, for the introduction. Uh, I would like to thank Open Classroom, uh, our colleagues, Laura, Betsy, who are really working on our speaker series today. Thank you so much. So good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, depending on where you're joining from. Uh, welcome to our iChad and Smart Africa speaker series. Um, so this uh, series brings together our scholars, including our faculty, but also collaborators um, and researchers um, around the globe. So on the African continent, everywhere, who come together uh, to share with us their work on child, on child and adolescent health, um, a range of public health um, issues that they are working uh, on across the continent. Um, and today happens to be our last series uh, for this academic year. Uh, so we are very, very privileged to have um, uh, Professor Pen uh, um, Achayo, who I'll introduce in a little bit. Uh, but I wanted to highlight that, that today is our last one, but we will, um, again, have a year-long speaker series uh, starting in the fall. Um, and I will also like to, to welcome our new um, iChat and Smart Africa trainees. Um, um, at iChat and Smart Africa, we, ju we just don't do our field work, but we also um, 
um, committed to capacity building. And as a result of that, we have ongoing training programs for um, our fellows, our graduate students and postdoc and, 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 and doctoral students. So we have a new, we have uh, three new cohorts joining us today as well. So welcome. Uh, hopefully, you know, in the coming year, you'll be the, you know, the individuals we are introducing to present some of our work. So we are excited about that. Um, uh, Dean Mary has touched upon this. Uh, we have our upcoming uh, Smart Africa conference, and this is focused on, um, it's an annual conference on child behavior health uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this year's conference is going to happen next week. So on Wednesday, um, April 20, uh, 22nd, and on April 23rd, it's going to be virtual. Uh, so this conference brings together academicians, re researchers, policy makers, our collaborators on the um, on the African continent and globally, to try to uh, to discuss and and address some of the gaps uh, to 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 close the gaps on child behavior health and mental health uh, and improve children's outcomes. So this is our fifth conference. Um, it's going to be virtual here. I think Laura had, has just put um, the registration and more information in our chat. So please go ahead and um, register for the conference. And um, I try to attend if you're available uh, next week. It's going to be uh, fun. So um, with that, um, oh, and I realized I, I, I didn't introduce myself uh, in, in, in detail. My name is Proskovia Navunya. I'm a research assistant professor at the Brown School. Uh, I'm also a co-director for, for iChad. Um, I co-direct the center with uh, Dr. Fred Sawamala and Dr. Asensoi Osgibaha, and we work collaboratively at the Brown School and also with Dean Mary and uh, multiple of our, our collaborators on the African continent. So, so with that, I would like to introduce our speaker today, Assistant Professor Penina Achayoleka. She's, she's a colleague. Uh, she's a friend. She's a colleague. We work together um, uh, on, on, on study and also conceptualizing other studies. Um, I'm, I'm really excited today because uh, when in most cases, when you hear about, you know, school of design or in, in, in the school of social work, you often wonder how are these going to connect, you know, what do we have in common, but actually we are connected and I'm, I'm so happy that she's going to talk about some of that, you know, connection today in her publication. So a brief bio about um, uh, Penny Nash is an uh, assistant professor in communication design at Sam Fox to uh, School of Design and Visual Arts uh, here at WashU. Uh, her research and creative work is centered on using a human-centered approach to solve social problems. She collaborates across disciplines to explore communication design's role in making complex healthcare-related information accessible to a wider audience. Um, in developing communities. She has worked in Kenya, in South Sudan, and Uganda most recently. Hopefully you're going to present some of our, and highlight some of the work we're doing. So the, uh, the, um, she's, uh, topics range from tropical diseases to mental health related issues. Uh, she's, she teaches a spectrum of courses that encourage students to work with local and international partners to address complex social issues. So uh, today, uh, Professor Penna is going to uh, talk to us about the interdisciplinarity of human-centered design, uh, fostering participatory design research approaches to address public health-related issues. So we are excited to welcome Professor Penna to our uh, speaker series. So um, Laura will be monitoring the chat. If you have questions, please feel free to, to add those to the chat, and then uh, Penna will be able to address those. So welcome, please, the floor is yours. Feel free to share your screen. Thank you so much, Dr. Prescovia. Really excited to be here today. Okay, so hopefully everything looks okay. Um, yeah, such an honor to be here today, uh, to have the opportunity to engage with um, a broad audience. Uh, usually when you think of design or the art school or people that create and make and you think about the spaces uh, within which we talk about the work that we do. Um, you don't often think of spaces such as this, but I think uh, given given the kinds of 
topics and projects that I'm interested in, and given that they're really inter cross disciplinary endeavors, I think audiences such as um, the open classroom, uh, as well as friends of the smart African Aisha community is perfect to just share, share best practices, share ideas, methodologies, and, and engage in conversations about how our two areas really intersect. Um, so such an honor to be here. Um, I also just wanted to, uh, to quickly give a, a shout out to, I know they've been talking about the conference. It's kind of perfect actually, because my first uh, encounter with the iShed Smart Africa team uh, was in Uganda when I was, I was in Uganda doing research, my own research. And uh, somewhere, I actually don't remember who exactly said it, but I heard there was this conference happening that was hosted by the Brown School. And I'm thinking, wow, Washington University is in Uganda. Uh, and I do not know about this. So I decided to just go to go check it out. And it was the second, it was the second annual uh, conference at the time. And it was fantastic. I got to meet uh, phenomenal colleagues who are now also uh, collaborators with me. And uh, it's exciting to hear that the conference is continuing to, um, to grow. And I would also just like to encourage uh, those of you who are not necessarily directly affiliated with the Brown School, uh, but maybe you're coming from other disciplines and you're curious and interested in learning about uh, public health and um, child behavioral uh, approaches to, to give it a shot, attend it and, and see, you just never know what comes out of it. So really um, lots of thanks for that. Today, I thought I would, um, I would talk to you a little bit about my own practice, um, how I situate what I try to do in a truly interdisciplinary lens, but also peel back um, the curtains a little bit and talk a little bit about process, uh, talk about some ideas that I'm starting to see uh, lend themselves to how we can engage communities in more equitable ways. Uh, but I'd also love to engage in conversations about, you know, where the opportunities are for design and communication, um, what's exciting about uh, such partnerships, and uh, I look forward to an engaging conversation. So at the Sam Fox School, uh, like Dr. Foscovia is so kind to introduce me, I um, am a faculty advisor also for a new minor. We have a minor called the Minor in Creative Practice for Social Change. It's a new minor. It's a way that we are trying to um, encourage students who are coming from other disciplines to, to learn about how designers, artists, architects work towards um, social change. It's, it's, it's an attempt for us to, um, to expose a lot of people to the processes that we use and also provide a platform for students to then think about how their own disciplines might intersect with creative practices. You don't have to be a maker or a designer to take the classes in this minor, but it's just an opportunity for you to, to learn about how um, creative practitioners do it and also practice a little bit and try a few things. Um, again, given the nature of, of the work that I'm interested in, I'm also a scholar at the Institute for Public Health here at Washington University and also a faculty affiliate with the iShed Center. And like Dr. Proskovia said, my research uh, cuts across multiple disciplines as I try to really investigate uh, where, where does communication design fit in two topics that have to do with complex healthcare um, information and things like that. So when I think about the work that I do um, for, again, I don't know how many of you in the audience know of design or designers and what we do. Uh, I will say though, we, what we do is around us, that the, the, the messages you interact with, whether they are on your mobile interactive devices or whether they are uh, in the built environment, uh, design is everywhere. We, uh, we create, uh, messages, we use images, we use, we use typography to make things clear, we inspire uh, behavior or change, uh, we, 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 we allow you to think about how to orient yourself in a space, if you think about wayfinding, um, we, you know, it's in posters, uh, so we can amplify messages, so that's all that, that's all and so much more that designers do. Uh, something that for me in my practice, which uh, when I think we think about designer communication design, uh, a lot of the work that I do, given that it's, um, it focuses on social issues and complex healthcare issues, it's sort of in this sub-discipline called social impact design. And um, really within social impact design, there are so many other 
um, I would say variables and things that we have to think about because we're working directly with people, mostly from usually from vulnerable experiences, audiences, and populations. It's uh, it, it's our role to do that in an equitable uh, and in and a responsible way. Uh, Victor Papanik, who is um, industrial designer in some in some cases people will say he's sort of like the, the the grandfather of this area also also a big critic of the area has always um called upon designers to think of design as a transformative tool that um can take social and ethical perspectives into consideration so beyond the form and the things that we do design can be that tool that can help us drive and achieve social change so um like, you know, just just a little quick visual. Um, I think you know, in the past when I've when I've engaged on topics that have had to deal with uh, complex healthcare related issues, I've usually seen them through the lens of designers. And usually, what that looks like is, as a designer, you're burdened to a team to either provide support for visual materials, um, and usually, some most times that tends to be towards the end of a project, not so much at the beginning. But um, but I think. As I've continued to advance in my career, I have realized that whereas you know we see disciplines that are more health, health and public or global health focused are addressing those complex issues, creatives and designers are also doing that on their own. And what does it really start to look like when when these two areas start to intersect? I'm really interested in navigating and finding out those those opportunities where our methodologies could align, where uh, we can start to forge new pathways, even to really think about what what it means when we're both looking at those issues in an interdisciplinary way. So um, just a, a really quick uh, graphic here by Next Design Leadership that I, I think captures a lot of the sentiments that I'm talking about is in the past, like I've said, you know, designers, we've usually worked in our own little bubbles, I would say, uh, executing projects, products, uh, services, and ideas. Uh, but today, I think when, when we talk about trying to tackle complex issues, we realize that uh, complex issues, given, given that they're complex and wicked by nature, uh, we really take more than one kind of thinking or more than one kind of perspective or discipline to, to really interrogate. So I think it's important that as we think about the, the role of a designer in the future, that we're really trying to consider what does it really look like or mean for a designer or someone who works in the creative field to work in this truly interdisciplinary way? And how can we best equip ourselves with the kinds of skills that are needed uh, for us to do this kind of work and what does that look like and one of the I think one of the the processes and the methodologies that has allowed for people to better understand what designers do is um, through the human centered design process or even design thinking which I'm assuming some of you might have may have heard about but human centered design really human centered design what it does which is also really in the name is that it centers the people that you're working with it offers a creative problem solving approach to understanding your users better, you're understanding their needs um, in order to, in order to create and 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 think about outcomes, whether it's product services or experiences, but that are relevant to their own circumstances. Um, yeah, so it's key to make sure that you know as we're thinking about how we understand people, it's the, it's it's the it's the idea of what it means to empathize with them. Now, empathy is easy. You can it's easier said than done. You know, when when you define empathy, people think of it as it's about putting yourself in someone's shoes, trying to understand them. But sometimes people are so far removed from our own lived experiences that it's really hard. So, what does it really mean for us to to truly empathize with our people? The people you're trying to serve and when we talk about creating and delivering uh in the creative field we talk about it as we think of it as experimenting this is thinking about the products that uh, or services we're trying to design that we uh that we uh, we use processes that allow for us to really tinker to be messy to come up with low fidelity prototypes that people can give feedback to so that experimental mindset is really critical when you're engaging in a human-centered design process it's also thinking about how do we evaluate the outcomes of, of these ideas um, so like I said, you know, empathy is, is a lot of things. It's, you know, is, 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 it's about listening to understand and now the pandemic has affected all of us in so many different ways and, um, and, and, and beyond even what people are dealing with, you know, that has added and as, es you know, excavated so many of those issues. So what does that mean to really understand those contexts? And what does it mean to have deep empathy for the people that you're serving? Um, and again, like, like I said, when you're experimenting, you're, you're, you're trying to observe what people say, what people do. You're thinking about how people make, you're thinking about how you can create something really quickly so you can put it in the hands of the user so they can work with it and you can learn from it and you can get a sense of whether it's viable or feasible or not, right? Um, so this is a, a graphic um, that attempts to 
to sort of summarize that process, it's, it's not really a linear process. Like I think you've probably come across graphics that talk about that human-centered design process. That is these steps, you know, it's like you're empathizing, you're defining the problem, then you're ideating and experimenting, and then you're reviewing. But really it's not as linear as um, sometimes, you know, the visual graphics that you see might explain. It's actually a quite a messy process. And, and I think um, there's, there's a mindset that is really critical to have is what they call a beginner's mindset. When you go into the human-centered design process, it's really imperative that you allow for yourself the space to, uh, to adapt as you go. So if you, if you try to understand the people that you're working with and you think you have, you have a sense of, of what the needs are, and even maybe you have a sense of what you might need to create or develop that responds to their circumstances, it's okay if as you're testing those ideas, um, it doesn't hold. Just, just be ready to, to go back and say, maybe we need to go back and redefine. Maybe as we review, we have to go back and think about how best we can understand that issue. Maybe somewhat, something was missed in the process. So it's a messy process. Uh, another way to think about the human-centered design process, which uh, the Design Council's uh, di Double Diamond um, illustration tries to, to illustrate is it talks about that process as a combination of divergent and convergent thinking. So if you think about it, like when you when there is a, a topic, uh, an issue at hand that you're really uh, wanting to interrogate further, usually you start off by divergently researching, understanding it better as you're finding themes, patterns and, and potential uh, ideas that, 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 that help you understand it better, you start to converge, you start to, to think about, uh, okay, what is the problem here? How am I defining it? And even after you've defined it, you sort of have to go back and diverge again and say, you know, are these ideas that I'm, that, that I'm trying to think about, uh, ideas that are appropriate for the audience? It's that sort of like converging, diverging approach. And this is also kind of a, another graphic that uh, tries to show that. So now that um, um, we've talked a little bit about what human-centered design is, uh, I want to sort of start shifting gears a little bit into participatory design. Um, this is this is sort of an an approach that I have in the in the last several years found to be a really interesting opportunity that uh, designers can bring to the table, especially in these interdisciplinary um, partnerships when we're working towards solving or addressing public health related issues. So participatory design is a collaborative design research approach in which technical experts aim to work together with representatives of impacted communities to design appropriate solutions. So it's thinking about what does it mean to create um, environments, activities that would allow for us to collaborate uh, in a way that 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 is hands-on and actually also involves making to better understand the people uh, that we are trying to work with. So when we think about it in in um, in sort of these quadrants um, and the graphic that I talked about earlier is at the bottom left there that talks about how designers are sort of starting to move into this interdisciplinary space that allows for them to think about what kinds of skills that they bring. Um, when we're when we're thinking about addressing complex challenges. Participatory design sits in that top right quadrant where it's saying uh, to, to, to address complex challenges in a, in, a, in a multidisciplinary way or interdisciplinary way that really allows for stakeholders to have a hands-on uh, stake in, in the developing of their own solutions. Because you know, we believe that um, anytime you're working with audiences that are vulnerable or you're addressing a, addressing a social issue, the people that are closest to that problem are the very people that know and have um, the best possible solutions to those issues. Now, usually there are factors that are hindering them from, um, from getting to that place uh, of implementing or seeing those solutions actualized. And usually um, the role of a designer or the team that is working uh, with them is sometimes create the conditions for them to be a part of the convert, to, to actively participate in the, in, in the creation and development of those solutions. Now, oftentimes, which has also been like in my own experience, um, it has not always necessarily looked like this. Sometimes as an expert or as a researcher who has the tools and the knowledge and the education and statistics around the issue, you know, we, we will apply, you know, ethnographic research practices. To, and sometimes we understand the problems from a little bit of a distance and, and come up with solutions. And oftentimes the solutions also, you know, will, will be valuable to some degree. But I'm really interested in looking at what does it look like when we actively involve the users not only in, in how we engage with them or interact with them through interviews, focus groups, uh, or culture probes, but when they're actively involved in, in, in actually creating these ideas with you. And what does that look like? So 
Uh, what, what? We, we do yes. have one comment and I, I suspect you're heading in this direction, but I want to, yes. to um, acknowledge. Kathleen says, would love to hear an example of a challenge in order to help me apply these conceptual slides. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> okay. I figured. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so yes, yeah, so we're gonna get to some case studies here soon. Yeah, so, um, so like I was saying, so with the participatory design process, you know, we, we can think of when we tackle an issue, we think about uh, what people do, what people say, and what people make, because we, we you know, research, you know, research shows us that people don't always um, do as they say. Uh, and sometimes it takes time to build trust and get to know them in order for them to actually tell you um, their um, actual lived experiences. So what does it look like when we actually start to involve them in, in, in making in a hands-on way? So it's saying through observational research, focus groups, interviews, all these other great ethnographic and anthropological methodologies, we can learn, gain baseline knowledge, and gain some really valuable feedback from them. What does it look like when we involve them in actually making or creating, or even like documenting through writing, drawing? Um, you know, what can we learn from that kind of framework? And so I'm, in, in, in some of the projects um, I'll share, you know, I think we're starting to see some really interesting insights that are emerging from that. Okay, so here's a first case study. So uh, this first project here I wanted to share with you um, is a project that for me uh, started to, you know, give me, a, give me a sense of where that gap and maybe where a participatory design methodological lens would have, you know, would have been really interesting to see what kinds of outcomes we got. So, so this one here, uh, we, we did not so much uh, use a participatory design approach, but we still had uh, some opportunities to engage with um, the people we were working with. So it's, it's um, and also just from a, from a quadrant, sort of lens, it, it had a very specific defined task. This is where as designers and creators, we were brought into the team to work on a very specific, in a very specific kind of way we were developing graphic tools and deliverables that were going to be used in relief efforts in Kibera, Kenya. Um, so in the abstract on the previous page, you know, it has to do, you know, with healthcare information, making it more clear, making it more visible because there are so many misconceptions, including false rumors about sicknesses, treatments. So the team that we were working with, which is um, an ungovernment organization that was working in Kibera, Kenya, was, was, was having a hard time um, delivering uh, appropriate medication to the people that they're wanting to serve. So whereas they, were, they had a clinic with medication, people were shying away from, uh, from the organization for so many different reasons. And so they were thinking about what would it look like if as designers and creators, we were able to help bridge that gap that they thought they felt there was something missing in communication because also in Kibera, given that Kibera is this huge slum uh, sandwiched in two highly industrialized parts of, uh, of Kenya. Kenya is, in, Kenya is in the Eastern part of Africa. Uh, it's in the East of Uganda and it, and it has, um, Kibera itself um, is, is, is a highly, a densely populated informal settlement, which, you know, is, is, is not unlike many other cities, a couple of cities um, in contexts such as this. A lot of the people that live in Kibera are coming from um, rural parts of the country in search of a better livelihood for themselves. They come into the city and when they get into the city, they realize that all oh, the standard of living is actually high. It's not easy to get a job. So they end up in these informal settlements in the city. And uh, because of that, they don't often have adequate access to healthcare and things like that. So we, we were called on to explore and see, you know, are there, are there opportunities for, uh, visual tools or solutions that could help us better communicate with the people in Kibera. So if you look at the quadrant, you know, we were burdened as sort of experts. We didn't have as much opportunity to directly engage with the audiences we were working with, uh, but we were able to use different kinds of um, um, ethnographic and anthropological methodologies to understand the audience better. Our partner was working actively in Kibera, so they had a, a bunch of research uh, help to help us understand uh, the people that we were working with. Um, and you know, I think one of the things we looked at was the healthcare seeking behaviors. So to better understand why people are shying away from healthcare, um, healthcare services, we wanted to understand what are their behaviors right now and what does it, where do they predominantly seek their um, health services? And uh, we found out really quickly that the most trusted uh, places that people are going to are traditional healers. Traditional healers are usually your typical neighbor, someone you know in the community you've grown up with, uh, you trust them, they'll use local herbs uh, to treat different ailments and symptoms of different diseases. Then chemists tend to be this like sort of um, middleman broker who sometimes get um, medication from 
you know, hospitals, clinics. So they'll buy those and they try to sell them um, to the people at, you know, different prices. Uh, it's, it's really a business. And then usually the local clinics are the last places that people go when they're really in like dire need. And some of that also uh, is because when you think about the, the um, just the kind, the kind of life that they're living in Kibera and, and, the, and the very limited resources they have, if, if someone, if a family of five says living on a dollar a day, healthcare is going to be like the last thing on their mind between rent, food, and even water, um, that money goes really quickly. So people are going to the clinic at the very, very last minute. So we, we, we had to think about ways in which um, we, we, could, we could encourage people. And also the other thing was, I think when people got the clinics, because most of the clinics are predominantly English, English speaking spaces, uh, people sometimes didn't always feel like they could be as eloquent or could actually describe what, how they were feeling. So we tried to think about, okay, what would it look like for us to create some kind of graphic solutions to bridge this gap? So from a, a, vis, a visual anthropological study that we did, we were trying to get a sense of, okay, what does the visual literacy level of people uh, in the area look like? How do people read images? I think sometimes when, when you have learned how to read and understand depth of field and perception, you don't think about how someone who uh, doesn't know how to to, to read depth might interpret. So in, in, the, in the test on the bottom left, when you think about that, that image, you know, who is closer to the spearman? Is it the elephant or the gazelle? Now, for someone who has, who, who knows how to read depth of uh, space and, you know, you, you know, middle ground, foreground, middle ground background, you, you can see given, uh, given the scale of the elephant, that elephant is further away from the spearman. Uh, but for people in, in, in Kibera in this area, of course the gazelle was the closest because, um, of course, the elephant to them was the closest because not, not so much that it was further away and smaller, but because, you know, when you think about that sort of like 2D plane left to right read, the elephant is the closest thing. The gazelle, despite being that it's, it's front and center, uh, to them feels a little bit further away. So we, we, we started to, to think about how, what does it mean to design on a 2D flat, flat images versus images that have, you know, so much uh, depth of field perception, bearing in mind that our audience um, uh, when you when you when you add that depth of field, it adds another sort of barrier to how they can understand or comprehend an image. And also, images we're seeing uh, from images and pictures and ground showed that a lot of them are really flat and really simple, not so much background noise. So the iconographic uh, approach seemed like um, it was valid. So in this case, we. we decided to come up with a set of cards that um, could be on hands uh, at the clinic with doctors and clinicians that if someone came in, uh, they could at least use these cards to describe how they are feeling. So take a case in point. So for this is what potential cards for malaria, which um, is, is a very common disease that uh, is spread through female anopheles mosquitoes and it's highly treatable, highly preventable. Uh, so what would it look like if, you know, in the clinic, people could use cards to actually describe uh, their signs and symptoms. Now, for me, this is where, uh, when we think about the quadrant again, we designed this from a distance, and then we were able to, to user test them. We created them, and then the, the, the doctors and the clinicians we're working with had a chance to review them, um, and then the audience also looked at them. And it was very interesting because the first thing that the, first thing the clinicians told us was, uh, most of the patients we see have uh, little to no educational background. So, as limited text as we can have, the easier it will be for us to explain it to them. So it's almost, you know, how can you design and, and describe these symptoms with very little text to explain it? So when you look at some of the studies that we did, so the first one on the top left there that talks about fever, the one on the left is the, 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 the iteration we had. So for fever, you know, you know, we're thinking about like, you know, someone feeling hot. So this little um, uh, sort of, sort of, trying to illustrate that. And, and I think for the people, again, making sure we're very clear is that just looked like a really bad hairstyle that someone had, and that did not say anything about fever. So for them, it's like, of course, if someone has a fever, you put something on their forehead, like a cloth, cool them down. And so it started to make sense. And I'm like, oh, this is fantastic. And then when you think about, you know, how do you illustrate nausea without, you know, images or without words? Um, so for us, we're trying to capture nausea. It's like, you feel like your head is spinning. And so again, we're trying to get very descriptive about it. And then for them, it's like, that looks like there's a, a wire on someone's head that is just wrapped in their head, it does not translate. So when you include and involve the people you're working with to help create this, they said, oh, nausea is easy. You feel like nausea, your stomach feels terrible. You feel like throwing up. 
great. And then if it's feel if it's fever or chills, um, just even the positioning of, of one's arms, like I think the one we had first created on the left, it looked like someone had chest pain. Uh, um, but really when you have chills, it's, you know, the motion is really like on your arms. And so to me, this started to really show what the opportunities would really be if we, we had the chance to, from the get-go, create with the people that we're working with. And so we took that same idea and looked at the dosage information, which is another huge barrier. I think doctors and clinicians were really having a hard time trans you know, when, when, when someone comes and, you know, you give them a prescription and they get their dosage, it comes with this um, dosage sheet that has all this text and explains so much and people won't even read it because they don't even understand it. So what does it mean when we start to strip down that information to the bare bones and the bare minimum? What do people really need to know? Um, and so this is sort of, these are some iterations of what that uh, dosage system starts to look like. Like the doctor said, you know, the most important thing is that um, we can tell them, just give us a medium within which we can help them understand uh, the kind of dosage information they need to know. So based on your age, based on your weight, you need to know how many you need to take morning, evening, we'll get them started and that's all they need to know. And then we went on to create um, uh, some posters and things like that that could uh, be put up in the clinics. And so the team took these and now these are being used in the clinics and they're collecting some data to see uh, I think they've seen an increase in people coming to the clinics and being able to relay a lot of um, um, their signs and symptoms. They're coming to the clinics a little bit earlier now, and they can point to different feelings to describe, and the doctor can work with them to see, based on all these different symptoms, you know, there's a chance that you might have malaria and things like that. So that, that to me, um, was sort of a, a project that started to give me a sense of, of what it would look like. I, want, I started to get really curious about the gaps, but also the opportunities that might exist when we start to create with people from the get-go. Um, so the next project I'll just quickly talk about is, is a study that we are currently doing, which again, I think like Dr. Proskovio was um, saying in the beginning, has been a great opportunity for, for myself uh, at the design school um, and them to come together and, and, and create a research project that will allow for both our disciplines to interrogate and think about how we can address issues around mental health. So this project is called Say No to Stigma. It's about making mental health more visible among school growing children in Uganda. Um, so the, 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 goal of the, the goal of the study is that we're going to develop a set of appropriate visuals that are going to be culturally relevant. They're going to be um, put around the school environment through signage um, to reinforce messages around um, mental health. And, and it's interesting because I think one of the things that for me was critical with this project is that, you know, that the study made a case for uh, us using participatory design practices to really work with our audience to develop these messages, that these were not just um, visuals that we we're going to come up with by ourselves by way of understanding them, but that we were going to still do the legwork to understand them through other ethnographic research practices, but that more importantly, we were going to engage them in the processes of creating these visuals. So that's the study team, um, like I said. And just to give us a little sense of a background on the study, um, children in Sub-Saharan Africa comprise about 50% of the total population. Um, current mental health services are severely under-equipped to meet their needs. And in fact, growing up, I'm from Uganda, growing up in Uganda, mental health is actually something even that, um, you know, you don't really necessarily call mental health. It's something, I think now people are starting to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, because they're they're seeing such um, devastating effects of the pandemic, especially, uh, but not so much from um, from a young age. I think that's an audience that's still very vulnerable, but not really engaged with. So I think for us, the study was also going to present an opportunity for us to understand how are young people in primary schools engaging with uh, issues of mental health, and how do they even describe or call mental health? Is it even um, something that they are aware of? Um, so we also know there's so many widespread misconceptions towards mental health and there's so much stigma. And um, it's, you know, at least for me in my experience as growing up, people that um, were seen to have mental issues were, were known to be mad or crazy and uh, that needed to be put in an institution of some sort. And, you know, people don't want to associate with you like it's something contagious. So there's definitely a, a huge gap there in education. And, um, and so that also hinders people's health seeking behaviors when it comes to issues around mental health and there's so much isolation that comes with that. Okay, so something that we were trying to really think about <clears throat> when it comes to 
let's see, take my slides. Okay, there we go. So the study design, um, we, we had a target, you know, we, we wanted to focus 67 children uh, from one primary school. We, we uh, and this is also where I think that interdisciplinary aspects are really critical because my colleagues at the Brown School of Social Work, you know, are able to think about how to design these focus groups to help us gain baseline information. So them taking leadership on that was really a great learning opportunity for me to see um, how to do that in a way that is, um, that does not exclude, but includes um, the right audience members. And uh, the focus groups were really fantastic in giving us a baseline knowledge on on the audiences we're working with, it, it was very clear that uh, the, the children that we were, we were talking to actually do, um, do have an idea of what mental health is, it, even if it's not necessarily called mental health, that they see these indicators um, and they're able to express them and they're able to sometimes even describe um, what, what some of those signs are when, uh, when someone is isolating themselves and what, and what that looks like. So from the information we took from the focus groups, um, we, we in, in phase one, we were able to think about how can we explore the use of, of, of visuals to further understand and, and reiterate um, their, their sort of understanding of around mental health in, in a way that is more uh, hands-on, uh, creative and allows for them to make. So in, in phase two, um, the participants are going to take the visuals that we create and interact with them. We're going to see if um, they are they are appropriate. You know, you know, you know. We'll do some user testing in phase three with a new group of students to see what the students um, in their earlier phases had created to see if that's still appropriate. Does it still read? And um, and just really getting a lot of feedback. So this process was really just designed to allow for multiple eyes and multiple audience members to engage with the project in different ways. So include, again, because of the pandemic, uh, we a lot was halted, but we also had an opportunity, thank, thankfully, because of the great infrastructure um, I shared has in Uganda, we were able to really work and train our, our research partners and, and really uh, work with them to execute these workshops virtually because we were not going to be able to be there, but we wanted um, the work to continue. So all the recruiting, all the focus groups were still able to, uh, to be conducted in a safe way with the audience, with our partners in Uganda. The, the workshop goals was a really critical place for us to think about what is really the intent of this participatory and co-creation sort of experience? What do we want to gain out of this? So we knew that this was, this was going to be a great way to build upon the insights from the focus groups, but creating a space for, for students to, to imagine and, and be a part of that solution. You know, what, what do new messages that reinforce uh, and promote uh, healthy mental health behavior look like uh, in your school? How can you draw right um, and make those together with us? How can we make them active creators and actors in this? So at the end of the day, these solutions are by them, for them, and, and, and it's them that will sort of take care of them um, in, in the long term. So how can we inspire new language and conversation around mental health? So this was really, for me, like uh, the first opportunity to just see this in action. So granted that all this was happening virtually, we were thankfully able to actually pull it off over the course of two days, worked with uh, two different groups and um, for a period of like five hours with breaks on hand. So through a variety of, of uh, smaller group, individual, um, illustrations and opportunities. Some students who we knew from the focus groups actually were more reserved and actually were not speaking up as much. They really like just shined in this activity. They were able to, to, to illustrate, to draw, to actually um, to express uh, some of these ideas on paper. And it was just really great to see. And now as our, as our team is starting to just make sense of all the findings, we received so many examples and ideas and, and the students were even starting to think about, uh, you know, what, what might some of these messages say, you know, if you're trying to promote healthy, mental health related behavior, what does that look like? It's even things, and in their own way, it's things like, you know, don't laugh at someone who has a problem, you know, and, and I'm seeing them either through writing or through drawing, they are, they are able to express um, 
you know, what it's like when you identify someone who is sad and what does it mean, you know, to, to go close to them and talk to them and engage with them and uh, to, to, not, to not isolate them. Uh, but also we're starting to see some really interesting socio and family dynamics um, having a huge impact on mental health, which is what the research also says, but it was great to see the students draw and illustrate that and, and for us to understand what that looks like. Then also I think from a design perspective, by the time we, we, we create this, uh, signage and messages, the visual vocabulary, the look and the feel of, of this final product are going to be truly theirs. And, and, and I hope, so right now our team is actually currently auditing and taking stock of all these images that they have created, looking for themes and patterns. And, and as we're creating them, I am so hopeful and excited to see how um, they will hopefully have impact on, on, in the school community and that the students will feel a sense of ownership around them. And um, so that's currently where our, that project is. And just as I uh, try to wrap up something that also just to take, to, to take these concepts and ideas and myth methodologies one step further, uh, I think beyond the context of research projects, I'm trying to think about just long-term, like what does it really mean when um, we start to think about how to equip people that are in those very communities and contexts with these methods so they can actually apply them for themselves and execute these ideas. So I started a, a series of workshops that I've been running since 2014 with uh, mostly in the city of Kamp in Kampala with young people. And every summer we get together, they come to the workshops with ideas for of social issues or problems in their communities. And my job there with them is not so much to, to, to give them the solutions to these issues, but we, we, we train and talk about the human-centered design methodologies, participatory design practices, how to define problems, how to use divergent and convergent thinking. So we talk about all those ideas and then it's fantastic and phenomenal to see them just take it and run with it. And, and, and so for me in, in that moment, you know, my role sort of starts to, to involve me stepping back, observing, uh, facilitating, and things like that. So I think long term, when you think about the the, the, the areas of you know public health and uh, global health and interrogating social issues, to be to be fantastic to think about what agency means, what empowering really means, and and how we are, as practitioners can start to make and not get too too precious about that knowledge, but get sort of make that knowledge more accessible. Just like at least for me as a designer, my role is to is to make messages and information clear so what does it mean for me to take the methodologies i use and apply and make those more accessible what what might that yield or look like in the in the long term so that's something that um i'm also working on so i hope that sort of gives you just a general sense uh into how i work into what i'm starting to think about as i work on uh, and find ways and intersections for what I do um, in fields and disciplines that uh, usually designers and creatives are not necessarily usually seen to work in. So thank you. And um, I'd, I'd be happy to engage with you further on this. You're on mute, Dr. Prosi. Oops, thank you so much, uh, Penina, for an excellent presentation. Um, so I'll give it to Laura briefly if there are any um, questions that are coming up. Yeah, we have some comments and um, we do have Betsy monitoring the, the YouTube channel. So we did get a comment from Josephine there. Um, let me find it, oh, okay. I really like the participatory design approach. It is also the best way to foster project sustainability, especially when we make use of the available community resources. And she thanks you for your presentation. And then Kathleen says, very inspiring process and iconographics. Um, and also this is really wonderful. They must have felt, this is about the, um, the workshop with the children. Um, they must have felt good being invited to give input, feeling their perspective is important, getting to contribute. Love the drawings. And um, also from Kathleen and some other appreciation um, from Charles and Dr. Fred um, and from Kathleen, curious why the iconographics don't employ facial expressions. So I'm guessing you're talking about the the Kibera project with the malaria icons. Yeah, that that was quite the process. I think um, at, at, at some point, once we actually got the first round of um, prototypes into the hands of the users, 
they just love that they, you could you are focusing directly on the symptom and maybe it's also the nature of the kinds of symptoms you are illustrating they they still were able to hold without the expressions now it's interesting with the mental health project we're seeing that you know facial cues play a huge role in 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 how people express themselves and so i feel like this in this particular case that's going to become really critical but i think in the other project um it was so much about just like the the gestures of the body and you know you know how your body feels and and that was quite also interesting so i'm glad you picked up on that Kathleen says, thank you, very interesting. So we definitely have time for more questions, so please do post them. Yeah, and I'm also, and I'm also curious to, to hear a little bit from, and Dr. Fossey, I don't know to put you on the spot a little bit, but in this little time we've, you know, worked together in this way, um, it's you know I, I, I'm based of based on just like the initial results we're starting to see. Um, I'm curious to hear from you like if there are any uh, ideas, things, or patterns that are sort of maybe new and different that maybe you find uh, exciting or are causing you to think in a different way, given the the process we're using. Yeah. Um. So what can I what why what I can say is, um, so we haven't got a chance to, you know, to read through all the focus group interviews, but just from, you know, how the process has been, and uh, we are trying to think about how we, we can be able to package some of our, you know, some of our interventions, some of our, how, our health related messages, how can we adapt what we currently have and make it more age or population appropriate so that you know our, uh, our groups in the field or our the people we are working with can be able to uh, utilize this information. So we have several interventions where we have either manuals, uh, but you know, a manual is good, but it may not be as fun. And um, our children we work with may not be able to relate to it as much as if you know they're, they're the ones drawing the um, uh, the pictures or the messages. So we are trying to think along those lines, um, how do we package this, but also think of thinking about uh, new ways um, of, 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 um, of incorporating their ideas in the work that we do. Thanks, we do have a couple more questions coming in. Um, one is, a, or a few, um, one is about that initial kind of um, depth perception graphic that you showed in the literacy um, survey. So can you share more about how cultural and um, kind of environmental influence a uh, culture and environment influence how what people see and how people see? Um, what what are the factors that attribute um, to the contribute to someone's depth perception? In yeah, I think it's, it's interesting because it's actually something like I hadn't really thought about until that study because um, I think I guess prior to learning about um, depth of field and 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 understanding you know you know distance and thinking about like what's closest to you for a gram to gram background um, it's something I think when you when you haven't like had to learn about it you don't necessarily I would say think about I think people read read images in different ways, which is also, I think, fascinating. I, I wouldn't say there's like a right or a wrong way. I think uh, for people that, most people that have uh, have learned and have, uh, have in, encountered this kind of education will, will immediately associate, easily, more easily associate um, distance with scale and perception and things like that. I think what's becoming interesting with this uh, Say No to Stigma project is, the images, I think even beyond what the, the messages are, they are very specific cultural cues that you can see that are in the dressing, that are in uh, the relations. So the way a lot of the images that, that depict a uh, relationship between kids and their parents is a kind of respect and a kind of, there's interesting how through space and distance, uh, they're able to sort of capture those mannerisms. Um, there is also um, a way in which, uh, you know, it's it just from like gender norms. You you, you know, 
boys dress a specific way and girls dress a specific way and moms like you know just even the, the way they're depicted through clothing is also very specific to that culture and I think that's something that I'm grateful that we have because we can now capture because we would love this to be very specific for them to understand uh but the, yeah I think culture and your socio and environmental experiences play a huge role in in the way you uh, even color you know it's something that color theory is something you haven't even touched on but we start to see how colors are used very fiercely and unapologetically in this context and and just how that adds um uh, a different le level of meaning and understanding to how we experience images and and messages um yeah so i don't know laura if that touches a little bit on what you asked yeah, and actually you anticipated another person's question about color use, oh. so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, and William says, could you talk a little bit about measuring health outcomes in this setting? For instance, would you examine how the visual um, visuals improve access to health services and how? Yeah, I think I think that's something that I'm hoping, especially this is where that truly interdisciplinary piece comes into play, because that's not necessarily my area of expertise. I think in the past, um, we haven't necessarily, haven't necessarily always had the opportunity to be a part of those conversations in the early stages of planning a project. And so even like with the Malaria, the Kibera project, um, the, you know, those findings, you know, are, you know, sort of like hand off to our partner and the design firm that actually we're working with and, and they sort of like carry on that. Um, now, I think that definitely um, gathering and, and trying to think about impact from a quantifiable lens like they're trying to track how many more people they are getting into the clinic but also how many people now are able to articulate and uh, express their um, symptoms early on so those are metrics i'm sure that they have i think now that i've had a chance to be a part of um, this project sort of uh, from the get-go that's something that um, i think this project in some ways is a pilot for uh, hopefully like a future study that would really hopefully give us the opportunity to see how uh, interventions such as this uh, start to really impact and, and hopefully inspire um, um, just change around mental health and, and hopefully see that also like on a larger scale to really better even understand what that impact looks like. I don't know, Dr. Prossi, if you uh, want to speak any specifically to anything else. Concerning metrics. Yeah, I was thinking in terms of let's say access or even utilization of um, um, you know health services. So we 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 were thinking a little bit about um, issues around the use of prep and you know how some women who may be at risk but they feel stigmatized or unable to to use that medication because you know people they think they may think mm -hmm. that you know they're um, are living with HIV. So as some kind of you know design would be. Um, very good because if you know the the packaging is similar uh so this is where you know penny and i would come in and and work with the women to say what would be more comfortable for you uh what kind of packaging mm -hmm. you prefer as opposed to you know the standard packaging so that we are that thinking along those lines and all right, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Penina, for an excellent presentation and response to, 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 to the questions. And I hope um, our audience has learned something of where we can connect the design, but also how do we use it in public, you know, public health outcomes and you know, to improve uh, these outcomes among our groups. Um, so thank you everyone for, for attending and I will pass this back to Janet to close us out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Prasi. And thank you, Dr. Panina, for a wonderful presentation. Laura, as always, um, really able moderation of the chat. To our audience, thank you for joining us. Please stay healthy and safe out there. And we look forward to seeing you at another Open Classroom very soon. Goodbye, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.